Welcome to Funding and Disrupting, the most in-depth business podcast for technology companies looking to raise capital and the venture capital firms that fund them. We interview venture capital firm managing partners and tech company founders to get the real story of how it all came together. If you're searching for funding for a disruptive or innovative technology, or you're searching for the best companies to invest in, then you've come to the right place. Now, let's get funding and disrupting with our host, Keith Herman. Hello, everyone. I'm your host, Keith Herman, and welcome to today's episode of Funding and Disrupting. Today, my special guest is Kyle York, the co-founder and CEO, managing partner of York IE. York invests at early stage through Series A startups. They're also primarily focused on business-to-business subscription and software as a service companies. So let's get straight to it and welcome Kyle York. How are you, Kyle? I'm great. Thank you for having me, Keith. Sure. Kyle, why don't you tell us uh, where you are today? Yeah, so I am. Uh, our offices are based in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, I'm working from home today. Uh, in Bedford, New Hampshire. So we're about an hour north of Boston on the East Coast. Uh, this is where I'm actually from and where we've chosen to build our company uh, here. So excited to talk to you all the way from the Granite State. Maybe I'm your first podcast guest from New Hampshire. Yes, you are. And and I want to learn more about that. Why don't you tell us what it was like growing up? I grew up in the Northeast also. What? But why don't you were further north? Why don't you share with us what your experience was like growing up there and what were some of your interests growing up as a kid? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I grew up here. uh, I'm the middle child of five sons. So my parents had five boys. Uh, And so, you know, and I'm middle child syndrome to the max, as you can imagine. We all grew up playing sports. Our family business as kids was actually a sporting goods uh, retailer. So my dad and mom uh, you know, all the equipment, uniforms uh, for all the local little leagues and, and football teams and high schools and colleges. So kind of, you know, growing up with five boys in a small entrepreneurial business, focused on sports, as you can imagine, it was a competitive environment and a really fun and, and thrilling upbringing. I always love New Hampshire. You know, New Hampshire's uh, state motto is to live free or die uh, state. So, you know, we have a really entrepreneurial spirit. Um, you know, all the new England states are super close to one another. So, you know, getting to Vermont or Maine or Massachusetts or Rhode Island or Connecticut is a short drive, uh, for some in the Midwest or, you know, the West coast, they sometimes can't believe that it takes me 45 minutes to go to a Red Sox game from where I live. Uh, and you know, we grew up with the four seasons. So we're in November now as we're recording this podcast and, starting to get a little colder, you know, and uh, the snow's coming, but you know, it's great in New Hampshire because you really appreciate uh, the seasons and kind of have different activities uh, throughout each season as well. So we're just about to get into ski mode and all that. So yeah, growing up here was um, again, just a really great experience. I did move away. You know, I went to school outside Boston, Boston and did, I ended did, up moving to California. So I, you know, I, I've been on the road a lot for my career, but I've seen all places. Where, where did you go to college and what did you study there? Yeah, I went to Bentley University in Waltham, Mass, business school. Um, I studied uh, marketing and minored in management. I also played college football. So it's a division two uh, football school. So I uh, played football there, defensive back. So yeah, I mean, that's, I learned a lot. I mean, it's a, it's one of the best schools for undergrad business degrees in, in the country. And uh, it's 10 minutes from Boston, right? So it's, uh, it's a city of its, in and of itself, but it's also right connected into Boston, which was really an awesome college experience. Yeah, they're actually, uh, Waltham is known for watches, I don't know if you know the wall. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, what I remember of, that is absolutely spot on. And um, there was actually like a brewery when we were in college called like Watch City Brewing. Uh, I'm not sure it's still there right on Moody Street in Waltham. But yeah, it, it, you know, a lot of those mill buildings had a very similar um, feel to the Manchester Mill Yard where our headquarters are, which was predominantly textiles and footwear and things like that uh, back in the kind of industrial times. So a lot of the cities in New England are like those mill buildings on a river that have not now all been turned into uh, really cool uh, commercial uh, and residential um, establishments. So it's, it's pretty cool types of office settings too. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. I love, I love the history there. 
So why don't why don't you explain to us a little bit about your career path from let's say going from college yep. to York IE? Yeah, so it's been a pretty fun ride. I mean, we uh, founded York IE in 2019, and I got out of school kind of early 2000s. I ended up kind of getting lucky. I interned, you know, while at Bentley uh, for a software company that at the time was making a transition from the licensed software model, uh, licensed software maintenance to su subscription to SaaS. And so my first job as an intern was uh, putting together our playbook to call customers and get to convert to the new business model and to the new tech platform. So kind of dates myself, but my entire career has been in that SaaS, you know, business model. And it's what I know. Uh, customer acquisition, uh, delighting your customers, expanding those relationships. Uh, and I, I climbed the corporate ladder for that first startup that was a uh, focused on education technology. So it was an ed tech company. They sold private school software. It was called Whipple Hill. Uh, the company eventually sold to BlackBod, which is a public nonprofit software company. I actually moved to California for them. I lived in San Diego for a while on the West Coast. And have always kind of been in sales and marketing roles and grew into a sales and marketing leader. I was recruited back to New Hampshire. I, I don't think I expected, you know, going to school right outside Boston and moving to California early in my career necessarily to end up right back in my hometown. But I was recruited by a high school classmate who had co-founded a company called Dyn, uh, D-Y-N. And Dyn at the time was a you know consumer app that allowed you to have like Keith'sHouse.com and you could log back into your home network. I mean, think before you know um, you know iPhones and Nest cams and you know you wanted to access back to your uh, remote you know uh, server at your house. And so that's what the company Dyn was originally founded as. A lot of tech nerds would remember Dyn DNS, which was the name domain name system. Uh, and then we ended up taking that company. Uh, to the enterprise and using the domain name system, the DNS, to help uh, hyperscale uh, web brands uh, build up their infrastructure globally and ensure excellent performance to their end customers. And so I joined that company. It was 15 employees. We took it to 500 people. Uh, I was chief revenue officer along the way. We scaled it to 100 million of recurring revenue. And we sold to Oracle in 2016 after a uh, heck of a run uh, servicing the biggest brands on the internet. Uh, and we sold the company and I ended up staying for about three years inside Oracle and uh, really learned a lot, you know, kind of feel like I got my MBA at Oracle, you know, it was a very enterprise giant uh, juggernaut, you know, global, global uh, 100 company reported to the a guy who reported to Larry Ellison. So had a lot of insights and experience there, but in parallel, Keith, I had been doing a lot of, um, advising and independent board roles and doing some angel investing and pooling some capital with friends and creating different investment vehicles, running syndicates on AngelList. And, and so what I really realized is I'm a really good complement to technical founders. And when I created York IE, I thought to myself, wouldn't it be cool to be able to not just pick one tech startup and do that again for, but have a portfolio approach to business where we can make these um, capabilities and this advice and this counsel, this mentorship and guidance uh, more repeatable, repl replicable across the portfolio. And so a lot of what we're building now in New York IU is really the manifestation of the, the operating day job and the advising, investing moonlight job and trying to smash those things together uh, to form a new school company like York IE. So you've been an entrepreneur for, for quite a while. How would you describe your time at Oracle? I mean, Oracle is very different. What what did you learn there that you think was most helpful in terms of investing today? Yeah, I think um, I'd say the number one thing that was most helpful is if you think of Oracle uh, and you look at the last 20 years, they've been one of the most acquisitive uh, companies of private companies and public companies in the history of, of, of business, right? So they've bought over 125 uh, different technology companies over the years to become Oracle. Obviously, Oracle's rooted in the core database built for the CIA in the 70s. Um, but over time, it's become a kind of really um, prolific cloud platform player across all different industries and layers of the technology stack. So I think the number one thing was every single company who was looking for an exit uh, would go inbound to Oracle uh, to see if they wanted to buy their company. So the amount of inbound deal flow that came into Oracle and to really learn and hone in on the process to evaluate 
acquisitions, M&A for Oracle was a big part of my job while we were there. We focused on all the modern cloud strategy. So platform data layer down to infrastructure. So things storage, compute, networking, real kind of deep tech stuff. Anything that came inbound to Oracle for M&A, uh, my team evaluated, tried to find product sponsors, business sponsors, uh, look at these deals. We looked at deals in the tens of billions of dollars. We looked at tuck-in deals, acquires, and everything in between. So I think that like um, process, methodology, thesis, alignment, uh, you know, writing up strategic rationales, pitching those rationales to the executive team, all the way up to Safra Katz and Mark Hurd and Larry Ellison, you know, you just, it was, you know, baptism by fire. You know, you come in from a startup and you know startups, and then all of a sudden you, you learn a lot about how companies make priorities short, mid, and long term. And I think that's a big part of our um, process today to evaluate opportunities, but also our investment thesis in general. Have you had any mentors or people that you consider to be of significant influence in your life? Yeah, I mean, I'd say number one, you know, I'm a child of my parents, you know, my my mother, very smart, savvy woman. Uh, she's the one who grew up in the family business, which was the shoe manufacturing business. And my dad married in and he was this kind of tenacious, hardworking, uh, former, you know, star athlete. And so, you know, I kind of have the mix of my mom's like sort of thirst for learning and like like uh, attention to like education and intellect. And then my dad's like scrappy hustle, hard work, integrity, like go for it uh, mantra. So I always start with that. You know, I think everyone can say their parents, but I mean, I'm saying it not just in my upbringing, being a good upbringing and a well-rounded one, but also in the business, the family businesses that we, that we grew up in, you know, so from a business perspective, you know, it was always like, you know, uh, stick it to the man, work for yourself, control your own destiny, like deliver on your job and you'll eat a nice meal that night or go on a nice vacation that year. And I think that practicality of like business is certainly lost in the Silicon Valley growth at all costs, venture capital game. Uh, so a lot of that foundation is, you know, the manifestation of of where I live today and work and how I think about York IE and the tech space. It's just like, let's get back to the basics of like, you know, main street, small business and, you know, build good and healthy, sustainable companies. Um, you know, and then obviously I'm consistently studying the greatest in business of all time. You know, I, I've had different obsessions over the years, you know, Richard Branson's always one. I, I, I always think he, from the standpoint of like, you know, vision and also working on stuff he likes to work on. Um, you know, it's kind of like, that's a, there's a lot of pride in that. Um, you know, I've had lots of great, you know, um, you know, founders I've worked with, uh, you know, that are, have been my, my CEOs, uh, different board members, different VCs, but, you know, I kind of keep my circle pretty tight. You know, I have a, a really good team at York IE. I have a large family and, you know, I kind of try to try to bounce stuff off the people I trust, you know, and, and that's reciprocated. Let's start discussing York IE. Why don't we start with the investment thesis and how yep. you're different than other VC firms? Yeah, sure. So we are focused on exclusively B2B SaaS. So SaaS is software as a service for the audience, uh, recurring revenue businesses, early stage at the pre-seed, seed stage through series A. We invest, uh, we say up and down the stack. So what I mean by that is We'll invest in infrastructure technologies, cybersecurity, data, platform plays, all the way up through vertical applications and in specific industries. We really like um, to look at things like the market and approach to company building. So we like to study markets, competitors, comparators, differentiation relative to the market, more so than many times you see the product out approach to company building. I think I have a good idea for a product. I'm going to build it and see if it sticks on the wall. Um, we're very focused on founder market fit. So what's the founder's relevancy to the market in which they're building this technology? Um, and again, I mentioned it already, but we look for pragmatic business models, uh, thoughtful scaling plans, uh, capital efficiency, even at the earliest stages. We hate when we see a pitch deck that says, here's all of our milestones and they're all capital raises, right? Um, so, you know, we believe that the founder should uh, treat the company like their baby and, you know, uh, build it, build it their way. And we want to be a support mechanism for that. That's the thesis. I mean, it starts though at the top of funnel, Keith, we, 
we put out a tremendous amount of content. I mean, we do interviews like this, right, on podcasts, and 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 we put out lots of um, content, collateral, education, inspiration, curriculum, how to build and scale a startup out into the world, and that drives a lot of inbound deal flow to our website. And so when we launched York IE. We were like, we wanted an ability to work and influence startups at any stage of the company lifecycle from a low touch to high touch way. Clearly, if we invest, it's pretty high touch, right? We're we're on the cap table. Many times we're on the board. We might uh, you know, have different governance rights and preferred stock, but we wanted to be able to have a mechanism to work with companies all the way to low touch, like listen to this podcast or subscribe to our newsletter or read our blog or follow us on social media. So we have a SaaS platform that's also a freemium approach, paid approach to that platform for teams and enterprises. And then we have a bunch of tech-enabled advisory services. So think like a Deloitte, McKinsey, Gartner model for how to build and scale a startup. So we have a bunch of different capabilities there. So any startup in the world, generally, whether you're we're investing in you or not, we have a way to engage. And that's the model in which we're going to market with. What's your due diligence process like from you know beginning to end? <clears throat> you know, because companies that are interested yeah. in and in finding, you know, venture capital partners, right? Always want to know, <laughs> am I going to come out the other end of this, right? What's it going to take to get a close? So kind of tell us, you know, from, you know, how much time it takes and what they yeah. can expect going through it. Yeah. So, I mean, that starts at the top of funnel. I just mentioned, you know, we see anywhere from 100 to 150 inbound opportunities per month of startups saying they're looking to raise capital. So what's that mean? you better stand out on the first introduction, right? Because that's a lot of companies to sift through and just even qualify whether you're a fit. I think also it's important that startups actually do a little research coming in the front door. We put all over our website, all over LinkedIn, all over any place, any podcast that we specialize in early stage seed to series A B2B SaaS businesses. Well, if you're looking for capital and you come to us, hopefully your early stage B2B SaaS business, because that's what we do, right? So we're able to sort of vet out that qualification at the very beginning, you know, 120 deals becomes 50 that actually are early stage B2B SaaS, you know, recurring revenue business models. And so from that, we run it through its process. We do first calls, we review pitch decks, we approve, approve, review flash financials, we make some calls into our network. Maybe it's our investors. Maybe it's some of our employees. Maybe it's some of our advisors. to get a market perspective of those companies. We do several calls along the way. Typically, they're broken out between you know, product and technology, financials and business model, uh, team kind of traction, overview, go to market, customer base. And these are sort of the five areas that we look at. And a lot of times we pull in different resources uh, to evaluate. Different than a traditional venture fund model, typically what happens is all different partners of different funds are looking at all these different deals and they show up to a Monday partner meeting. They say, hey, we think we might want to drop an LOI and get into some post LOI due diligence before we close the deal. And then they kind of spar and squabble over it. Um, back to kind of borrowing a page from the Oracle model, we run our process more like almost like corporate development or corporate venture, where my team runs a series of different calls collects a lot of notes, writes up draft investment rationales, brings companies through the gauntlet or the process. And then as, as the next stage unlocks, our VP gets pulled in. As the next stage unlocks, my co-founder and our chief investment officer, Joe Raskin, gets pulled in. As the next stage unlocks, I get pulled in, right? So I'm probably only pulled into a handful of deals per month, and we're doing one to two deals per month, right? So I think it's a more methodical process where in more efficient process for founders where they're kind of cutting through the noise and they know, they know that process up front. We're very transparent about it. Uh, you gotta be a thesis match, but then you gotta kind of get it through the gauntlet and all those key areas. Let's talk briefly about a company that you participated in, in funding. It's called Vet Vetro. Uh, why don't you tell us? Oh, what... I'm wearing the sweatshirt today too. That, was, it, that could have been intentional or unintentional. I don't know. <laughs> well, let's talk about, First of all, where they're based and what do they do? Yes, yeah, so it's a cool company. They're out of Portland, Maine. Uh, yep, so that's the other coast, not Portland, Oregon. Uh, Portland, Maine, really well known, known for uh, seafood and lobster, uh, if you're ever out in the Maine area. But Portland has a really burgeoning uh, tech ecosystem. There's been a boatload of investment up there, uh, both 
from the public and private sectors of cool new um, software and technology companies. So Vetro is a GIS mapping uh, technology. So what they do is they run a mapping infrastructure that helps um, carriers, municipalities, governments uh, build and deploy um, modern networks, 5G fiber networks. Uh, so they're, they're mapping guys. Uh, the founders, Will and Sean, uh, came from mapping. So they're mapping experts. And they actually used to run an agency or a consulting shop that would use different you know, off-the-shelf tools, Google Maps, Excel spreadsheets, to help these companies build out their, their networks. And so they decided to build a proprietary uh, platform with a bunch of proprietary IP that does this in a self-serve and then layered on service basis. So it's a full on SaaS business uh, growing really fast. Uh, we ended up investing in their seed round. I want to say probably must have been 2020 is my my recollection. Um, and they ended up raising a follow on round of financing from Resolve um, growth partners uh, later. So they've raised, I think, over $12 million now in funding, uh, growing really fast, uh, chasing down 10 million ARR. And, you know, just a really, really awesome, I mentioned earlier, our thesis, vertical software application. You know, they know their market. Uh, they know who they sell to. They know their repeatable use cases. They know their value prop for customers. They can create target lists and they can set up BDRs and salespeople to go chase them and market to those audiences. There's lots of industry trade shows and events. And it's one of those, when you do vertical software applications, Keith, it's like, it's kind of like when you win pillar clients, it helps you win the next clients. It's kind of like a, a fear of missing out or a FOMO strategy to go to market. And that's what I love about vertical applications. It's a point and shoot, uh, go to market uh, model, and uh, you just got to execute and continue to thrive. So we have a very engaged uh, relationship with them. Um, my, one of my partners is is on the board. Uh, we've helped them on advisory services, everything from capital strategy to financial operations to marketing communications and go-to-market strategies. Uh, and, you know, it's just one of those great engagements that's working and, and the company's growing and healthy and uh, we're really excited to see where they take it. What was your, how did you get introduced to them? And, uh, and what was, what was that like your initial discussions with them? Yeah, it's a great question. I have to look, it's precisely the intro, but the, I remember the, um, uh, we, we, we've been doing a lot of networking in this kind of main ecosystem. Um, the main venture fund, the main technology Institute, uh, the Rue Institute, which is associated with Northeastern university. These are like kind of um, fixture mainstay organizations in the main technology ecosystem. And so I believe we're actually introduced to them through uh, the main venture fund or one of the firms there. We had actually done a deal prior to Vetro in a company called Defendify, which is a SMB, small business cybersecurity platform. And we, sh we shared an um, investor there. So that's how we got introduced and connected uh, to them. You know, a lot of these things are interesting. They're nuanced. They take they take a few calls to kind of learn. Uh, these guys were making a transition from their old business, which was more of a services model, pay for time consultancy on how to build out these networks to this SaaS transition. So a lot of um, our favorite companies, it takes a little bit to learn about them, are the ones that are making that transition because they've clearly proven they can build a good business in services, but they realize the scale potential of that business is limited by their time, right? So, you know, those are really great companies already proven a market need, already showed demand, and are trying to think of how do we create enterprise value and scale? And the way to do that's through software, right? And data platforms. Um, and so that's what they were doing. So that was, I remember the very beginning parts of our due diligence was like, is this even a SaaS business? Like, are they serious about this transition? Do they have any initial proof points that are proving the market's ready to buy through a subscription model or not? Um, we did a lot in this one on um, market tailwinds. So think like federal funding going toward uh, future infrastructure builds and deployments. Um, billions and billions and billions of dollars of federal money has been going into these areas, uh, getting earmarked in these areas. So that was another tailwind uh, for us. And just the legacy players, the, 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 the tools that historically were used outside of cobbling together the off the sh shelf kind of stuff or general stuff was very um, antiquated technologies that we thought there was a great opportunity. So sometimes in these businesses, they're disrupting existing markets. Sometimes they're making their own market, um, you know, really at the end of the day, as you know, it just comes down to really solid execution 
And, you know, we believed in the team and they've been they've been proving it so far. How did you determine they were a, a good fit as an investment? And what I'm trying to get at is this. In other words, you look at a lot of different companies, you spend a lot of time and there's the economics and whether or not you feel they can execute. But do you also keep in the back of your mind that York IE is looking to build a portfolio of certain types of companies? Yeah. So, I mean, you're, you're spot on. I mean, you can <laughs> we can talk thesis all day on like, how do you qualify if someone like generally fits? Right. Then you're getting down into those five key areas and you're like sort of stack racking them, but no one's a hundred percent performer in all five areas. Right. I mean, even, even at scale, you know, watch an earnings call and no one's getting, you know, a plus plus on every area of their business. Right. As a public company. So bring it all the way down to startups and they're like Swiss cheese, right. You know, there there's holes everywhere and you're trying to just determine uh, what you think. So I think at the end of the day for us, um, yeah, there's terms, there's valuation, there's governance structure, there's board, there, there's all those things. But I think we look at it a little bit more differently we're, we're, because we don't come from like financial services or VC or PE or banking backgrounds. We come from more the operator side. I think a lot of times we have to put ourselves in their shoes to say, do we think we can help this company scale to be a bigger company and a, and a bigger success story? Is there enough here operationally that we believe uh, these this company can execute and that we can be additive on that growth journey? Um, it's a more operator lens than straight like financial portfolio engineering or financial engineering lens. Um, a lot of that comes down to intuition, uh, experience, both from being active operators, but also just working and evaluating so many startups over the last 15, 20 years, right? I mean, at this stage, I've probably looked at, you know, 5,000 companies and worked intimately with hundreds of them uh, to determine and study business models and scaling opportunities and plans. And, you know, so you, you do end up coming down to like gut feel. I'll give you an example. There's a deal we haven't closed it yet. We just dropped the term sheet to lead their, um, their uh, seed round. And it was a company out of New York, and we we went through the process and we we ended up saying no. It was a young founder, a couple of young founders. We thought they were a little too green. We thought their business model was a little, their financial models were a little uh, thin in their maturity. Uh, we, we didn't quite believe in their traction growth rates, like where they're going next year, the year after. It just felt like it was you know, just not quite strong enough. And, and we ended up saying, you know, we got so many other great deals. Sometimes it's just that, right? We have so many other great deals in the pipeline. Um, and we, we went and we said, no, we said, we're not going to do this deal. And um, to the founder's credit, he was like, I'm not going to take no uh, for an answer. And he said, I'd like to get together in person. And uh, I guess karma happened that we were going to be in New York the next week. So we went down to New York and we met with them and we dropped the term sheet on them at the end of the last week, you know, because in that meeting, he came so prepared with all the areas that we thought he was thin or maybe scoring a little lower on or that or our concerns. And he was able to give us a really clear narrative on uh, what he was doing in those areas to to move himself forward and why we should believe in him and his team and why he thought we were the best partner for him. He didn't want just a check writer or, or a VC who had never lived a day in his shoes. He needed our support and our infrastructure and resources uh, to help. And we ended up doing the deal. So so hopefully that gives you another like lens into like these things aren't always black and white. Uh, you know, we have a lot of companies we haven't chosen to invest in that we've regretted after, you know, they've gone on and done very well. Um, this is the nature of the game when you have such a wide swath of companies and a big, a big top of funnel to evaluate and, and make decisions on and a limited capital pool. I mean, we are methodical. We do 15 to 20 B2B software investments a year. We have a growing capital pool. We're just under about 20 million a year. We call it an evergreen syndicate model so it's not um the same as a fun construct which we could get into but it but it literally is 20 deals a year broken down into two six month windows and we have a budget every six months about how much capital we have to deploy um it's not ever, never ending so we can't do every deals uh, every every deal we see so i think that um that kind of running it like a company with a budget with a strong thesis uh keeps us in our lanes really really well what's your typical process like in terms of you issue a term sheet to a company and you say we're we're interested in you know funding x amount of dollars 
what can they what can a company expect what is it you're going to ask from them to evaluate more specifically as you start to get into the details of of the transaction that's a great question so it's a little different for the earliest stage i feel like you end up process wise getting a lot more depth of intel before a term sheet than you might later stage or even in MA settings right like so by the time we would issue a term sheet or maybe let's say someone else has already issued a term sheet and we're participating, it's probably like half and half, you know, half we're issuing the term sheet, half some other firm is, and we're thinking of participating, right? But we do a, so much of the work in the deep dives before the term sheet that honestly, by the time it's a, it goes to term sheet, it tends to just be now we're just drafting legal docs and agreeing on making sure, memorializing the terms in the term sheet, make it into the corporate bylaws and, and, you know, the cap tables, right. And all the right legal um, documentations all put together, if that makes sense. Again, I think that kind of shifts as you get later and later stage companies only in that they end up being different company profiles. And, you know, you see a lot more post LOI diligence in those deals. So by the time we get there, you know, we've already done uh, product demos, roadmap reviews, all the technology kind of moat discovery, We've already gone into the go-to-market motion, into the customer base, probably talked to a couple customers, uh, got a real picture. We've already dug into the financial model, into the bottoms up side of the financial model, both the top line and the expense side. Uh, we've already dug into the team, maybe even done some back channeling on them and the market and what we know, right? So, so, so much happens for us before the LOI that it's kind of becomes a formality once the LOI is issued that we're just moving to close. Um, and it's more legal and tax work that happens to get that done. If you can, if you can recall with, with regard to Vetro, what was the biggest challenge, if any, that you had in getting that closed? Yeah, I think it's tricky when companies are moving from a services business, a healthy services business, services businesses get a different multiple on revenue for their valuation than a SaaS business. A reason for that is services is time-based, usually lower margin, usually less sticky, meaning it's not recurring. It's not necessarily, you have to win it every year. For a software business, you know, if you sign up a subscription to HubSpot or Salesforce or Amazon, you know, you're, or Netflix, if it's personal, right, you're, you're paying for that and it's auto renewing annually or monthly as you go. Those businesses have higher margin, 70 plus percent gross margin. They're more predictable businesses. So I think for Vetro is really tricky to um, you know, give them credit for the business they had built in the services side, but also, you know, we were investing in the software business and the and the shift and the recommitment to recurring revenue SaaS, right? So how do you value that at the early stage, right? How do you Put a value on that that enables when you put in, you know, half a million or a million dollar check, how much ownership are we taking for that? How big should the round be? What should the board be after the round? I think a lot of it, once we got through, yeah, we want to invest in it, ended up being the deal construct, the amount of money to raise, the valuation, the terms, the board, the governance. And, you know, these are a lot of sometimes tough conversations and everybody's coming at them with different motivations and, I think in the end, you know, you need to align those things as best as possible. What I always tell founders is whenever you raise capital, you're actually selling a little bit of your company to an outsider. You better be sure you're going into that like a marriage and that you have, with all best intentions, have high confidence you're going to stay together, you know? And I feel like too often in the culture that's being created, it's like, it's just about raising money and people just need the money to deploy and put the work and they don't, they don't, um, treat themselves, their company, like they're the free agent, you know, they need to like flip the script and like, there's too much fanfare and vanity around the VCs. And it's like, at the end of the day, like you can choose who you, who your investors are. And um, that's hopefully how our founders feel positive about working with us. What I, it's actually great advice <laughs> to give to founders. What advice would you give to other investors that are, uh, potential co-investors? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends on the stage, right? But I, I think universal advice is sort of know your role. <laughs> you know, I think um, at the end of the day, it's so hard to build a company and be an operator. And for companies to continue to grow efficiently, effectively, to get to scale, to get to an ultimate monetization event, whether that's an IPO or selling to a private equity firm or 
exiting to a strategic like Oracle. It's such a um, squiggly line to get there and it never goes as planned, right? But very often, um, venture capitalists are, you know, legacy, you know, they've, in their experience, they've been MBAs or they've, um, you know, worked in financial services or they've been a banker or they've been a management consultant. And very few have actually worked a day in the shoes of the operator. And, and there's no like perfect playbook, right? So you can study case studies all day in business school. You can sit on boards and try to pattern map to other companies but at the end of the day, every company is incredibly unique and you need to sort of bob and weave and support them and figure out what they need to grow. And I think there's a, a way to do that that's more collaborative and doesn't create undue, unnecessary added pressure to the founders and executive teams that you back. Um, and what I've just seen so much, so many companies um, end up sort of stumbling or staggering under the weight and the pressure that they feel from their VC investors because the VC investors client is their investors, right? They're limited partners and they need to, they have a fiduciary duty to those investors. They're in essence bankers. They're managing money, right? And I just think the incentives can become pretty misaligned. Um, and they just got to remember that like these operators are like the company doesn't exist or work or do anything without them. So you got to try to create an environment and a halo for them where they feel safe and comfortable, not in fear uh, there all the time. And again, that's not a universal truth, right? There's great investors who have never been operators, right? There's there's operators who have become investors and stink at it, right? So, but on the margin, I think it's like, at the end of the day, we can't do anything as investors or your, the York IE advisory business if we don't have great uh, teams and leaders to back. So prop them up, make them feel confident uh, and continue to operate with high conviction and you know be their support blanket. Uh, and I, again, I just think sometimes that isn't the way it goes. And I've, I've lived it, right? I mean, we raised a hundred million of outside capital um, predominantly later. You know, we actually bootstrapped dying our company to 30 million before we ever raised a dollar. When we did, you know, we were left alone for a while until we became like this pre-IPO darling, or we we're going to be a big exit to someone like an Oracle someday. And I think it got really, really hard. And I, I feel like the investors and the independent board members um, didn't necessarily make life easier for us at all times. And uh, again, we can be challenged. I get that. You should challenge founders, but I do so from an aligned place is, is the number one advice I give. Great. Kyle, thank you so much for sharing your time and your experience. How may the, our audience get in touch with you if they're interested in being part of York IE as an investor, co-investor, if they're seeking capital? Yeah, or advisory services. We can work with anyone out there. So yeah, so please visit us at york.ie is our website. Across all social channels, we're at York Growth. You can find me on social channels at kyork20. Uh, and so we're we're everywhere. Subscribe to our blog, you know, uh, and our newsletters, you know, follow along and hopefully you glean some inspiration and support on your journey. Great. We really appreciate you being here. Wish you the best with uh, York IE. You got a lot going on there and uh, we, we know you're going to do well. So thanks again. That's it for today's interview. If you're a VC firm or tech company founder and you'd like to share your interesting story, please visit us at fundingdisrupting.com where you may learn more about the podcast and appear on our show. Until next time, keep funding and disrupting. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Funding and Disrupting. Don't forget to visit our sponsor, AuraCo.com, to learn more about working directly with Aura Collective's exclusive technology PR team. They'll help you craft your message, get noticed in the press, and help you get your venture to the funding finish line. Again, you can visit them at www.AuraCo.com. Keep funding and keep disrupting.